Now let me just tell you my approach. I like to use both the Old Testament and the New Testament together as a way of demonstrating that Jesus is God. And here's how I do it. I will take Old Testament verses that talk about Yahweh, and then I will look at New Testament verses that talk about Jesus and draw a connection between them. And by using this kind of a method, you can show that Jesus is God. Now let me just give you a brief illustration to give you a handle on what I'm going to say for the rest of the morning. You might compare the Old Testament to a richly furnished but dimly lit room. A richly furnished but dimly lit room. I mean, there's all kinds of incredible furniture in this room, unlike my room. There's all kinds of incredible furniture in this room, like a mahogany table, a plush leather couch, and just all kinds of other neat stuff. But the lights are so dim that you can't see this incredible furniture. Now, what happens when you go up and you start to turn up the lights on the wall? You start to turn up those lights. You start to see things in that room you never saw before. By turning up those lights, you're not bringing into that room anything that was not there before. You're just turning up the lights so you can see it better. Well, what we as Christians need to do is to approach the Old Testament from the greater light of the New Testament. And as we shine the greater light of the New Testament on the Old Testament, we start to see things that we never saw before. And by using this kind of an approach, you can start to see evidences for the deity of Christ. Can I give you some examples? Well, I'm going to give them to you anyway. I'm going to begin with the idea that Christ is the Creator. The idea that Christ is the Creator. Now, we're going to start back in the Old Testament. If we go back to Genesis, we see that God is the Creator. But there's another verse that I consider just really important, and that's Isaiah 44, 24. Isaiah 44, 24. In this verse, we read the following words. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, says. And I'm inserting Yahweh there. Your English translation says Lord, but Yahweh is the word behind it. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, says. I am the Lord, Yahweh, who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Now that's pretty emphatic, isn't it? According to this verse, who is the creator? Yahweh. Is there any other creator besides Yahweh? Anybody that claims to be creator besides Yahweh would be a false prophet or a false god, wouldn't they? But Yahweh is the only creator. Now, the reason why that's significant is that when you get to the New Testament, we are told over and over again that Christ is the agent of creation. We see this in Colossians 1.16, John 1.3, Hebrews 1, 2, Revelation 3, 14, and other passages as well. Now certainly this is not to discount the role of the Father. The Father and the Holy Spirit were involved as well. As I told you earlier, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we are told that creation is from the Father, but through the Son. The Father is the ultimate source, but nevertheless it was the Son, Jesus Christ, who was the agent through whom the universe came into being. Now, compare that with the Isaiah 44, 24 passage. Do you see the significance of this? If Jesus is the agent of creation, as the New Testament indicates, and yet only Yahweh can be the creator, put those together, and that indicates that Christ himself is God. He is Yahweh. And you need to be able to demonstrate this fact to the Jehovah's Witness. Jesus is not a lesser God than God the Father. Jesus is just as divine as the Father is, or else he could not be the divine creator. Certainly there is an authority structure within the Trinity with the Father over the Son, but nevertheless the Son is equal to the Father in terms of the divine nature. Now we could also quickly look at uh, Christ as a sustainer, and I'm going to move pretty quickly here. I hope that your hands are, are warmed up. Uh, Christ is also the divine sustainer. You know, back in the book of Exodus, we read that it was Yahweh, or God, who sustained his people during the wilderness experience. Over and over again, Yahweh intervenes to save his people and to sustain his people. Well, what's interesting is that when you get to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4, we are also told that Christ, the spiritual rock, accompanied the people in the wilderness. Christ was involved back in the Exodus. So the greater light of the New Testament helps us to see some things we didn't see before in the Old Testament. 
And by drawing this connection between the Jesus of the New Testament and the Yahweh of the Old Testament, this is a very powerful argument for the deity of Jesus Christ. The same thing is true of Christ as shepherd. Now back in the Old Testament, who was portrayed as being the shepherd? Yahweh, yes. Yahweh is my shepherd, Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd. And you see this emphasized throughout the rest of Scripture. In fact, Yahweh is said to lead his people beside quiet waters. Well, in the New Testament, it is Christ who is called the Good Shepherd. And his role is described in similar terms. For example, in Revelation 7.17, we read that the Lamb, Christ, at the center of the throne, will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. Now, by approaching the Old Testament with the greater light of the New Testament, we start to see things that we didn't see before. We see a connection between the Jesus of the New Testament and the Yahweh of the Old Testament. And you bring those truths together, and that represents a powerful argument for the deity of Jesus Christ. You need to be able to demonstrate this to your Jehovah's Witness friends. How about Christ as the Divine Revealer? Christ as the Divine Revealer. Now, before the prophets in the Old Testament would speak forth some divine oracle, what did they always say? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith Yahweh. And you see this all throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Now, what's interesting to me is that when you get to the New Testament, when you get to 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11, we are told that the Spirit of Christ spoke through the Old Testament prophets. The Spirit of Christ spoke through the Old Testament prophet. Now, isn't that interesting? Back in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. In the New Testament, the Spirit of Christ spoke through the prophets. By approaching the Old Testament with the greater light of the New Testament, we see stuff we didn't see before. We see a connection between Jesus of the New Testament and Yahweh of the Old Testament. And I believe that this is a strong argument for the deity of Christ. How about Christ as the God of glory? This is another example. I point you back to Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah is in the temple and he has a vision and he sees God in all of his glory. Uh, there's uh, seraphim angels hovering around the throne and these angels are singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. And uh, with two of their wings, they flew. With two of their wings, they covered their feet, indicating humility. But with two of their wings, they covered their eyes. Why? Apparently, the glory of God is so intense, so resplendently glorious, that even they cannot look into the raw glory of God without covering their eyes. Now, what's significant is that when you get to the New Testament, in John 12, 41, John 12, 41, we are told specifically that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus Christ. He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, that's very significant. Back in the Old Testament, we see the glory of Yahweh described. And in the New Testament, we see the glory of Jesus. We see that the glory of Jesus and the glory of Yahweh are one and the same. You see what I'm driving at here? This is a powerful indication for the deity of Jesus Christ. And you need to keep in mind what God said about his glory. Will he share his glory with anyone else? No. I will share my glory with no one else, Yahweh says. And yet Christ has the glory of Yahweh. Christ is the God of glory. Uh, the last thing I'm going to point out in this section is that Christ is the divine Savior. Christ is the divine Savior. And the verse I want you to make note of is Isaiah 43.11. Isaiah 43.11. In this passage, Yahweh is again talking. And Yahweh says this, I, even I, am Yahweh the Lord. And apart from me, there is no Savior. Now burn that into your consciousness. Yahweh says, I am Yahweh and there is no Savior besides me. Now, of course, the reason why that's significant is that when we get to the New Testament, we are told over and over again that Christ himself is Savior. When Christ was born, angels appeared to shepherds and said, Christ the Savior is born in Bethlehem. In Titus 2.13, we read of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you put those two together... Jesus is the Savior in the New Testament. Yahweh is the Savior, the only Savior there is, according to the Old Testament. And it's a strong indication for the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, by using these kinds of arguments, by comparing the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can start to show your Jehovah's Witness friend that Jesus is not a lesser God, but rather Jesus is absolutely divine. 
Yes, Jesus became a man and he condescended in becoming a man and he took on a lowlier position for a time. But in his divine nature, he is absolutely as divine as the Father himself. And this is one of the things that you'll want to emphasize. Now in my few closing minutes together with you, I would like to shift your attention to a few do's and don'ts of witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. A few do's and don'ts of witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. And I would like to give credit to my former colleague, Walter Martin. I came to see her eye and uh, took a job, and Walter Martin died six months later. I'll never forget that. But during those six months, Walter Martin did have a profound impact on me, and he still speaks through his literature and through his hates. And some of the points that he made are some of the points I'd like to share with you because I've adopted these points into my own ministry. So if you would, allow me just for a few moments. I'd like to share a few of those with you. The first do is, do identify with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Do identify with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, let them know that you care for them. Let them know that you think that they're a worthwhile person because they are. They're just as worthwhile as you are. You're not better than them. These are people that God loves. And for that reason, you need to treat them with that kind of respect. Jehovah's Witnesses are just like us in that they have families, they have a need for friends, they have frustrations, and they have fears, they have problems they're working through, they get cancer just like everybody else. Let's recognize that these people are human beings and treat them with the respect that goes along with that. If you can keep this in mind, that they are people who like their families and they have children and they have needs that need to be met just like we do, I think that you're going to find it a lot easier to talk with them on a heart-to-heart level. Now, a second do is this. Do labor persistently with the Jehovah's Witness. Do labor persistently with the Jehovah's Witness. Now, I know that some of you, you're watching the ball game and the doorbell rings. And your tendency is just to want to get it over with quickly so you can get back to your ball game. Am I right? That happens a lot. But you need to be able, you need to have a mindset in advance that says, I'm going to spend time when they show up. I want to spend some time and talk with them. And if that means also that you need to meet every two weeks, I think that you should be ready to do that. You need to labor persistently with the Jehovah's Witness. And that you should never give up unless they close the door. You should always be a willing witness for Jesus Christ up until the time that they close the door. And it may be that the Lord Jesus will use you to bring them to the living Christ, which is what it's all about. I wish you could uh, experience the kind of joy that I have in my own life, the kind of joy that I experience when I lead someone to Jesus Christ, the true Savior. There's nothing like it in all the world. You know, nothing like it in all the world. I hope that you can experience that sometime. Now, a third do is this. Do exhaust every effort to answer the questions of the Jehovah's Witness. Do exhaust every effort to answer the questions of Jehovah's Witnesses. As I said, we must not only be able to share what we believe, but why we believe it as well. We need to be aware of the verses, like I've shared with you today, that help, can help you establish the deity of Jesus Christ and the fact that Christ is the true Savior. Now, were the apostles involved in apologetics? Did they just preach the gospel or were they also involved in apologetics? They were involved in apologetics. For example, we read that Paul reasoned from the scriptures with the Jews and with the different people that he spoke with. We need to do the same thing. You don't have to have a seminary degree to do it. I tell you, some of you are scared of the fact that they might ask a question or bring up an issue that you cannot answer. And if that happens, you need to do what Walter Martin suggested, and that is all you got to do is say, you know, that's a good question. That's a good point that you bring up. I don't know the answer to it, but let me do some research on it. And I'm going to talk to you about that in the future. Maybe we'll get together in two weeks and we can, we can uh, deal with it. Now, the very next day, you need to call Paul Carden at his home phone. Write this down, 451. No. <laughs> there are fine ministries that can help you with questions that you may not be able to answer. Uh, certainly Paul's ministry and then Rich's ministry are among those, and certainly my ministry is there for you as well. And by the way, I might mention to you that uh, uh, just like there is an Apologia report that goes out over the Internet, there's also a monthly Reasoning from the Scriptures newsletter that goes out to 32 countries right now with many thousands of subscribers. 
and it's free for the asking. Uh, if you want that, you can just simply write me at ronrose at aol.com. ronrose at aol.com and put the word subscribe in there. And we can send you all the back issues as well. So if that would be helpful to you, then, then please don't hesitate. The fourth do is this. Do allow the Jehovah's Witness to save face. Do allow him or her to save face. Don't talk down to the Jehovah's Witness. They are just as worthy before God as you are. And when you share the gospel with the Jehovah's Witness and defend your position from Scripture, it's feasible that there might come a point when you might sense in your heart that you've won the argument. Now that won't always be the case. Sometimes you might feel like you've lost an argument. But if you sense that you've won the argument, that's the time to be magnanimous. That's the time to reach out and to help them. Give them the true Savior, Jesus Christ. If you disarm it that way, then instead of putting a barrier between you and the Jehovah's Witness, you can build a bridge to the Jehovah's Witness. Again, that compassion and that loving spirit means everything. When a Jehovah's Witness walks away from my doorstep, I want them to know one thing. Even if they disagree with my theology, I want them to walk away saying, you know, that was a nice guy. I'd like to make friends with that guy. That's what I would like to see happen. Now quickly, I've got two minutes. There are two don'ts. There are two don'ts. First of all, don't approach the Jehovah's Witness with a spiritual chip on your shoulder. A spiritual chip is the communication or the feeling that you're looking down on them. It's like, you're lucky that you came to my house today so I can set you straight. That's a spiritual chip on your shoulder. There's no room for pride in the work of apologetics. Friends, I told you earlier that Christianity is more than having the right answer. There's a relationship with Christ that is involved. Apologetics is more than having the right answer. There's a relationship with Christ that should permeate everything that you do, including your attitude and how you treat other people. Now, I learned through years of hard experience the importance of this. I used to use what I call the flamethrower approach in witnessing. That's where somebody shows up and you get out this flamethrower and just roast them doctrinally. See, you don't win anybody to Christ in that way. But you do win them to Christ if you've got a loving heart where you can reach out to them and share some of these scriptural points that I've given you today. And one final point. The second do is, don't is don't lose your patience. Don't lose your patience. If you should lose your patience and raise your voice, you've lost. You've lost. You're going to be tempted to raise your voice and to get mad, but don't do it. Trust in God. Every time you witness, trust in God to give you the strength to be patient. 